Good evening, everyone, and welcome to PSEG True Diversity Film Series. My name is Donna Walker Kuhn. I am Senior Advisor for Community Engagement at New Jersey Performing Arts Center. Our True Diversity Film Series is part of NJPAC's Standing in Solidarity program. Tonight, we have a robust panel of thought leaders who will discuss Stanley Nelson's documentary, Boss, The Black Experience in Business. Um, this discussion will center on this documentary, which is directed and produced by award-winning filmmaker Stanley Nelson. And it focuses on the issues faced by Black business leaders, whether climbing the corporate ladder or developing their own business empires. I hope you've all had the opportunity to watch the film, which was provided in your RSVP link. So today, we commemorate the unparalleled contributions of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. One of the many gifts he shared was his dream for equality, respect, and opportunity. This panel will share dreams of entrepreneurs and successful Blacks in business. The purpose of our social justice series is to bring our community together and to encourage everyone to take part in this movement to ensure civil rights uh, for all. <clears throat> NJPAC has launched a series of events and initiatives focused on, on promoting racial equality. And we're so happy to have our advisors, the Newark NAACP and the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. I'd like to now do our land acknowledgement. <clears throat> we have gathered on the unceded land of the Lenape people. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We must also acknowledge that the grounds NJPAC stands upon were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the voices of many indigenous and oppressed people. We acknowledge that the teaching of United States history in schools and cultural institutions and the media have left out many voices and difficult truths in order to create an idealized national identity. We acknowledge and honor that Black Lives Matter. And this acknowledgement demonstrates our commitment as a community working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of colonialism, oppression, and systemic racism. Before we introduce the panel for this evening, please welcome Jeffrey Stokes, Senior Director, Generation Development for PSEG Power. In his role, <clears throat> Jeffrey is responsible for the performance of technical due diligence for the offshore wind project. The offshore com components include the wind turbines, offshore substations, as well as export and array cables. Mr. Stokes represents PSEG on the board of the Research and Development Council of New Jersey and on the board of the Thomas Edison State University. Welcome, Mr. Stokes, and thank you so much, PSEG, for your ongoing support. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to tonight's event. I'm Jeff Stokes, Senior Director for Generation Development at PSEG, the very proud sponsors of the PSEG True Diversity Film Series. Our company, Public Service, and the PSCG Foundation are pleased to be longtime partners with the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. PSCG was among the earliest supporters of NJPAC and the True Diversity Film Series represents the best of that relationship. It is especially gratifying to speak to you during this week when we celebrate the life and the enduring legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This series reflects PSCG's commitment to Newark well, we are more than just another utility and more than just another company. Public service has made our headquarters in this community for the past century and then some. We'll be marking our 118th anniversary later this year. We're proud of our commitment as citizens of Newark and as citizens of New Jersey. A tremendous part of that commitment is our support of organizations such as NJPAC and what that support means for diversity, for education, and for the arts. Last summer, in the wake of the tragic killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the demonstrations that followed in cities and communities around the country, PSEG and the PSEG Foundation announced another commitment, the Powering Equity and Social Justice Initiative. The initiative is PSEG Foundation's $1 million commitment to support organizations that address the racial injustice, inequality, and human rights in communities of color in New Jersey, New York, 
and anywhere PSCG operates. Our first act under the Powering Equity and Social Injustice Initiative was to provide funding for Rutgers University and the Rutgers Center on Policing. PSCG has always had a unique and special relationship with many diverse communities we serve with Newark at the top of that list. When one of us is impacted in the PSCG community, we all feel the impact. That's why it's essential that we all join and act together to build a framework of equity, compassion, and respect that will truly benefit us all. We believe our long-standing support for diversity, education, and the arts help us contribute to that ideal as well. Now, it is my honor to welcome all of you to this important and entertaining event. Thank you all for being here. Please enjoy the film. Thank you so much, Mr. Stokes, for the beautiful welcome. Um, now I'd like to introduce our moderator for our panel this evening, Chike Uzoka. Uh, Chike is also known as the entrepreneur coach. Uh, he's a social entrepreneur, commercial real estate agent, certified business coach, author, mentor, and public speaker. But he's really passionate about helping entrepreneurs succeed. His organization is Valentine Global, founded in 2010, and it's headquartered in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, Chike specializes in entrepreneurial programming for all ages, which includes um, presenting workshops, seminars, books, interactive games. And in 2012, Chike published two books, The Young Man's Guide to Entrepreneurship, 16 Things You Need to Know, and he co-authored Boys to Men, The Guide for African-American Boys. Please welcome Chike Yuzoka. Thank you, Chike. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and you can hear me, right? Awesome, I'm honored to be here. Thank you to Donna. Thank you to my good friend, Katab. Uh, and the whole NJPAC team for bringing this out, as well as Jeff and PSCNG. Uh, so tonight, I'm only a moderator, um, but I'm honored to be here. I'm pleased to be here, and I'm excited for today's discussion. Uh, so it's no secret that Black people have always made something out of nothing, right? Which begs the question, why have we always had to do that? Why have we always had to have nothing? And so in NJPAC's social justice series, where they're highlighting matters of social justice and equality, this specific event is focused on business and Black people's experience in business here in America. And so with that, this evening, we have some amazing entrepreneurs who are here to share their journey and their insight on these topics. And so first, uh, each one of the entrepreneurs is gonna share uh, a couple minutes about their journey. And so first we have the actual creator of the documentary that you just watched, hopefully, uh, Mr. Stanley Nelson Jr. of Firelight Media. Hi everybody, and uh, thank you um, for inviting me here. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I created a documentary about Black entrepreneurs, but I'm also, I guess, an entrepreneur. I, uh, we run uh, Firelight Films and Firelight Media uh, out of Harlem. Uh, Harlem is our home base, and um, we're celebrating our 20th year in existence, So, uh, and we're going strong, um, producing uh, documentary films for um, the world. So uh, thank you for being here. I can't wait for the discussion. Thank you for joining us and, and uh, 20 years. Congratulations on that. That's, that's huge. That is huge. Thank you. Uh, so next up, we have Denise Woodard of Partake Foods. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm Denise Woodard. I'm the founder and CEO of Partake Foods. We're based here in Jersey City, New Jersey. Um, spent my career in corporate America, nearly a decade at Coca-Cola was my most recent experience and had no plan to leave what felt like the security of corporate America. Um, and my daughter came along, she's five now, but right after her first birthday, we realized she had a lot of food allergies. I was really frustrated with the options that existed um, from a taste perspective, from a nutritional perspective, and kind of from a brand coolness perspective. And, and so I left my career 
career at Coke in August of 2017. We launched Partake as a self-funded, self-distributed business, um, just hitting the pavement in New York and New Jersey, um, natural food stores up and down the street. And I'm proud to share that this year, you'll be able to find us in about 5,500 doors um, across the country, Target and Trader Joe's and all kinds of retailers. And we went from emptying my 401k and selling my engagement ring to, to raising a $5 million Series A that was um, led by Jay-Z's Marcy Venture Partners. Rihanna just joined us as an investor. And so we've had uh, quite the wild journey, but really grateful for the entire experience and happy to be here tonight. Yes, that's amazing. Congratulations on that. And I'm sure that our attendees want to hear more about that. So we will talk more about that. Uh, next up, we have my good friend, Kai Campbell. Uh, if you know Kai, you know you've probably had some food at one of the spots in Newark. So thank you for joining us, brother. And peace. Thank you um, for everybody um, for hosting this great event, NJ Pack, all the sponsors, PSCMG. Um, yeah, my name is Kai Campbell. I'm a, everybody knows me as a born and raised Norker. It's one of those uh, merit badges that you earn from the city. Um, but I'm extremely inspired by this film, uh, having been, you know, a very, um, you know, a great participant, my family being a participant in the, in the great migration as entrepreneurs um, through reconstruction to this day. I'm just a continuation of that process. And I'm extremely proud to be here um, just representing my family. And not just entrepreneurs, but activists, man. And you keep that going too. Absolutely. I mean, you know, always through action and activism. Uh, my grandfather was a kosher chef in New Jersey from the dark South or the deep South. Um, and I, I'm just here. I, I now own Braggins Delicatessen, one of the oldest restaurants here in Newark. Uh, we started our brand, Burger Walla, uh, six years ago. We just celebrated six years. Uh, we now have just launched the yard, um, which will be in Military Park. Um, and, you know, we just started Walla Food and Beverage Group, and we're looking to uh, other investments and opportunities in and around the state in urban New Jersey. Yeah, man. Thank you for joining us. We definitely appreciate it, brother. We're looking forward to hearing more about uh, where the future of Walla Food and Beverage Group is going. Um, so our, our last panelist is a good friend of mine, also a mentor to me. Um, his name is Lanier Richardson. He's an entrepreneur himself. He also is the uh, head of Rutgers University Center for Urban Entrepreneurship and Economic Development. Lanier, thank you for joining us tonight. Great, it's my pleasure. I think the um, host needs to un uh, to allow my uh, screen to come on. I think they got me boot uh, off. And while uh, while they try to, oh, there it is. Start my video. Thank you. So it's my pleasure. Uh, a, I have so much respect for the entrepreneurs on this panel. Uh, Kai, we all know as the homeboys made good. Denise raising crazy money, and Stanley. That documentary was outstanding. I mean, it's deep, it's thorough, it's informative, it's inspiring. Uh, I've seen other works by Stanley, and so it's just, you know, the Miles Davis documentary and others, just outstanding. So I, I can't wait to chop it up. As you know, I lead the Rutgers Center for Entrepreneurship. I've been in that role for about seven years. Uh, we've helped over 400 entrepreneurs, 70% of which are entrepreneurs of color, over 60% are women. Uh, I've had a long career as uh, as an entrepreneur, and so that's why the uh, you know the film was so inspiring to me. My father started a bar over 44 years ago; it's still open and operating today. Uh, and you know, I found this passion for getting resources to people in places that other people overlook and undervalue. And ever since I had that moment in 27 as a bank lawyer of making a loan to a entrepreneur buying a building in the tough side, tough part of the city I grew up in, that's been my passion. So uh, I'm happy to be on the panel tonight and look forward to talking with you all. And we appreciate you, brother. And we appreciate all the entrepreneurs for taking time out of their very busy schedules to, um, to fulfill this, this day of service, right? Um, I'm reminded of my first time in Tennessee and having the opportunity to meet uh, Marion Edelman Wright and Merle Evers Williams, 
Uh, and they impressed upon me that, you know, service is the rent we pay for living. And so I appreciate all you all for giving service today. Um, and so we're going to start with Stanley, of course, because you are the mastermind behind the documentary. And in the research, all the research you did for the film, uh, can you share what specific challenges that Black people had to face in creating their own, creating their own lane, creating their own businesses, their own products, their own services? Yeah, that, that's a great question. You know, as we started making the film, uh, we found that that was a constant theme throughout the film and throughout the story and the history of, of Black entrepreneurs, the obstacles that were constantly thrown in uh, up, up against us, the, the kind of the, the game would, the rules of the game would change. Uh, you know, we would be successful and all of a sudden uh, the rules would change and the rug would kind of be snatched out from under us. And, and that, um, you know, we, we really didn't start out um, thinking about that as much as, as the film kind of ends up being that. Because we found over and over and over again um, that, that Black entrepreneurs, you know, just it was like diving off the high diving board and then say, you know, do a triple backflip while, while you dive um, and, and over and over and over again. Um, but I think that one of the things that also, you know, we found also is that, you know, Black people, African Americans have a natural tendency towards entrepreneurship, toward, because there, there has always been kind of a, a ceiling in, you know, uh, working for others. And so, We've always found that working for ourselves, or think about working for ourselves as the way um, to success, and also, you know, personal freedom, and also working with some kind of uh, some kind of dignity. So that was uh, kind of the the themes that, that that kind of emerged as we did more and more research into the history of Black entrepreneurship. Yeah, no, that's that's amazing. That's amazing. And we definitely want to appreciate the fact that this came out. Um, I remember uh, one of my mentors, Alfred Edmond, made me watch it back in 2019 when it, when it premiered. And um, a lot, you just learn a lot. For everyone that hasn't watched that documentary, you need to watch it to learn about so many things that, that Black entrepreneurs have gone through. Um, now, uh, Kai, I want to talk to, to, your, um, to your journey. And so, I'm a big fan of Burger Walla, right? It's a neighborhood staple. Um, I've only been to Brogdon's maybe twice, but that's also a neighborhood staple. Um, one of those you created, the other one you purchased, right? And so as an entrepreneur of color, what were the challenges and obstacles that you had to face in both of those situations? And like, how did you get through those? Right, so that's a very good question. Um, you know, how I met Lanier, is because everybody in the world with respect to real estate development, urban, uh, small business development, always has the pretense of no, right? It's the assumption that we come from a negative uh, reaction or a negative answer to a question, right? And so Bragman's is truly a testament to the fact that people in our communities value excellence, they value uh, quality of service, they value quality of product, uh, and what we call and what we like to say is the best bang for your buck, right? Um, so at every turn when I was going across the country to basically cheerlead for uh, then Mayor Booker, Cory Booker, and trying to get people to invest in these urban distressed communities, everybody kept saying no, right? But again, as I talked about my, my history and my trajectory of my family, my grandfather moved up from Quincy, Florida, unable to be a chef in the South, right? But he came up to New Jersey and was fortunate enough to then found two restaurants of his own as a kosher chef, as a, as a brother, as a kosher chef, right? So if I thought that in the midst of Jim Crow, he, took, he didn't take no for an answer, I had to figure out um, how to become the best of a sharecropper and a bootlegger on my own so that I could create and co to control my own destiny with ownership, right? Um, so when you talk about those different parallel tracks, we all know that the same forces that were at play 50 and 60 years ago are still at play, right? We have um, an extremely hard road in front of us when, with respect to access to capital. Uh, Denise is very fortunate to have the investors that she's had, um, but we represent, and I'm, I'm not, 
you know, hope to not, you know, be blasphemous or anything, but we represent a small portion of people who speak a certain lingo, who can go out and raise capital, or fortunate enough to have earned enough capital to do this on our own. I mean, when I was, you know, with the city of North trying to assist people, you know, a lot of, I'm not the best cook in the world, right? There's a sister or there's a brother out there, you know, that's making a, a, a killer sweet potato pie. And the difference is that I learned how to communicate properly. I had the momentum behind me to do these things, right? And one of the things that we have to do is we have to really do things as a collective, right? So my grandfather knew that, hey, listen, I'm not gonna do this on my own. I'm gonna bring a couple of brothers and sisters from me. I mean, you know, from the South with me. I'm gonna look for partners uh, and I'm going to try to do what I can to start small, right? We have to learn to, to, to build on our existing building blocks or to start where we can build traction, right? And sometimes that means choosing the right banking opportunities or banking relationships or not, you know, taking on an opportunity that might be over your head or something like that. But it's also doing the work, it's doing the due diligence and knowing that, hey, listen, the forces that are at play, as long as I know what they are, I can combat them in some type of way. And there's, that's really what my NORC experience is about. And, and knowing that when everybody else says no, that we know that we can see some value and some opportunity in our communities. Um, and we're tired of people coming in and waiting for people to tell us that there's value, we're gonna let you know there's inherent value, there's some self-worth in our community right now uh, that we can build momentum and building blocks on. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's a, it, respecting the dollar, you know? Um, it, it, like I, I always talk about, we, yeah. we know that uh, as a black or brown sister or brother, um, as we go down the line, we work harder for that dollar. So we have a, a philosophy within our stores is that we respect that dollar so much more because it took that person so much more to earn that dollar that they're giving us for that same product. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. And um, and so you brought up Denise. So we got to talk, Denise, we got to talk to you, right? So a lot of people don't know this, but throughout your journey building your corporate career, you've always had these side hustles, right? Um, but now Partake Foods is not necessarily a side hustle anymore since the, since 2017. So tell us what in your corporate climb and in your success and journey as an entrepreneur, what are the common traits do people of color need to succeed in both worlds? Um, I think resilience, particularly in my entrepreneurial journey, I, I think I hit on it. Like you have to be willing to work twice as hard, unfortunately, and be told no a lot of times. I, I think the default de, de facto answer, particularly for a person of color, when you're approaching a new business venture, when whether you're approaching a new investor, it, it is no. And so having knowing your business inside and out and being able to speak to that so that people understand that, that you know what you're doing. But also, I think for me, what was really important was building a sustainable business. I, I don't think what I'm doing is rocket science by any stretch of the imagination. It was understanding how much my product cost, how much people were willing to pay for it, how much space was there in between that I could use to hire a team that I can use to pay for marketing and to be as scrappy as possible because knowing as a woman and as a person of color, it was gonna be 10 times harder for me to raise money than, than some of my counterparts. Um, and so going in, I think with that chip on my shoulder, knowing that, that the journey was gonna be hard. Um, you know, I think the side hustles that you mentioned Mentioned. So my dad was also an entrepreneur. And so that I think is something that seems to run uh, in the family for a lot of entrepreneurs that I meet today. He was in the army for about 10 years, got out and was an over the road truck driver driving for other people's companies. He would be gone for weeks at a time, sleeping in his truck, eating in his truck, living out of his truck, and finally saved up enough money to buy one truck and another truck and another truck. And so this idea, and he still runs a successful trucking company in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where I'm from. And so the idea of starting small and building on that, knowing how hard the journey was gonna be and how many people were gonna tell us no, it was, well, you know, I think there's so many times entrepreneurship is glorified and you see these like headlines of these like fundraisers and these flashy parties and all this press and that's not what the journey is it's 99.9% .9 like of a it's just a grind all the time and so knowing that it was for us our launch was 
filling up our storage unit in Jersey City, me packing up the back of my SUV and going to stores every single day, all day long, going to do demos after that. My husband works in corporate America and finance after work. He would like leave his, take his shirt and tie off and pull out his partake t-shirt and do a demo, bringing our daughter to trade shows on the weekend, like understanding that you really got to put in the work, but also like valuing that what you're doing. I think, um, you know, as we got to the point where we needed to start to raise outside capital, we got told no nearly 100 times. I have a spreadsheet of 86 investors that told us no. Whenever Marcy Venture Partners, Jay-Z's Venture Fund, invested in our business, we had $4,000 left in the business banking account. I had emptied my 401k, sold my engagement ring, but I still never had the thought to quit. Like I was like, okay, well, we'll slow down or we'll look for alternative um, means of financing, or we'll go into alternative types of accounts that don't take as much money. And so just knowing that like whenever one window closes, like when the door closes, you can go out the window or the back door, just like um, having this uh, scrappiness about you to, to figure things out because there's going to be a lot of no's and a lot of stuff that gets thrown at you. That's probably not getting thrown at some of your counterparts. And was it, was it the reason behind why Partake Foods had to be created? Was it that that kept you going and scratching and scraping and? I think so. So my daughter is nearly six now, but even though she's young, she gets it. Like we're, we're in a store when she was like two or three and she would say mommy's cookies. And so to know that I started something for her, um, you know, it would be one thing if the business failed, but for me to quit just because it was too hard, I wouldn't be able to, to look her in the eye. But I think, you know, what we learned along the journey was I started the, the company is called Partake because I wanted people with food allergies to be able to partake. But as a woman and as a person of color and a first time entrepreneur and a first generation college graduate, there's a lot more people that need a seat at the table. And so we've learned that there's a, a like a lot more people who need the opportunity to partake. And so I, I think you mentioned kind of, um, service is the, the rent for us being here. And so that's something that's really been important to me along this journey, whether it's mentoring other women entrepreneurs of color. We just did a partnership with five HBCUs to hopefully increase the diversity pipeline in the CPG industry, but figuring out how I can make the door a little bit wider for the next person and hopefully the journey a little bit easier is I, I think the thing that I get the most joy out of in, in running the business. I love it. I love it. It's it's all about the the why behind what you're starting, um, and if that why isn't I guess deep enough for you, the obstacles that you and Kai already mentioned they're gonna throw you off. They're gonna push you off the track, and you're gonna say, "Well, I didn't, I didn't you know, it was it was a, it was a thing anyway." I could, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, the why is very important. I always tell people that. Um, and so Lanier, um, you know, you and Q have helped over 400 entrepreneurs, right? And so as an entrepreneur yourself and also head of this big universities, you know, department for, you know, economic development, right? And urban yeah. entrepreneurship, it's like structural racism. So how does that play a part in, in the business landscape and how do you prepare the entrepreneurs that you're, educating, how do you prepare them for that? Yeah, so what's cool about our, our center is 95% of the entrepreneurs that we work with are not students. Uh, they're, you know, someone starting a consultancy or a tech startup or a restaurant down the street or, you know, a, a bigger firm. Uh, and of late, we've been really focused on um, sort of sharing a message around capital and around owning assets. So it hit me like a ton of bricks about a year ago uh, in a way that I have repeated now a thousand times. Wealth is created by owning assets that generate recurring revenue and appreciate over time, or at least have the potential to appreciate over time. That could be a business, that can be commercial real estate or other real estate. And so, so often, um, you know, if you just look at, you know, there's been all this discussion around racial racial wealth gap and how do you close the racial wealth gap and you know in, in almost every stat you'll hear the gap between uh you know the median household income of a white family and the median household income or median wealth of a black family you know there's a you know a 10 time a 10x difference but when you talk to uh, when you look at entrepreneurs that 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 gap shrinks by over 70 percent so this thought of dealing with structural racism dealing with income inequality, uh, wealth inequality, 
even Stanley's film, what was so clear was when you look at all of those racial, uh, you know, the race riots, especially, it was around where people of color owned commercial property, where people of color owned businesses, and they were able then to fund civil rights activities and support, you know, social movements and, and, um, and other entrepreneurs and other economic uh, development. So focusing our entrepreneurs on the importance of creating businesses that are profitable, that generate recurring revenue, that have the potential to appreciate over time, that are scalable and sustainable. Uh, I think the more we do that, the more people of color own those uh, type of assets. Um, you know, the, the, you know, we'll indirectly, initially, but then directly be able to address the systemic racism issue. And we can change the systems, uh, you know, as we continue to gain power. Economic. Yeah. Economic power, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so I want to I want to go to um, both Kai and Denise in terms of your corporate life and your entrepreneurial life. Um, their differences, right? But in terms of access, what 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 are the challenges that entrepreneurs of color are facing with access, not just to capital, but also to the resources, to the mentoring, et cetera? Um, I think for me, what I saw from an access perspective, um, I didn't have the social social capital that I needed to make inroads with retailers, with investors. Um, and so the way that I went about it, and thankfully people were receptive, was just being as scrappy as possible and being as authentic as possible. And so our first chain account for our business was Whole Foods. And the way that we got into that account was I emailed every single person on LinkedIn who had category manager at Whole Foods as their job title across the entire country until one person took pity on me and got me in front of the right person. And I had the opportunity to share our products and share our story. Um, and similarly, like we launched Target nationally earlier this year, I went to a trade show and I walked that floor until I found somebody who had, who worked at Target, who had a tag on that said Target. And I found them in the bathroom line and said like, hey, you got to listen to me. You got to talk to me. I have these samples. And so I think being scrappy about it was the difference. Whereas like Coke, the doors were just open for me because you were coming with the Coca-Cola calling card. But I also was just another cog in the wheel. Like it, the company was going to keep going if I, if I showed up or not the next day. Whereas at Partake, you know, uh, everything depended on, on me and my resourcefulness and, and figuring it out and my, and my desire to get those things. And so I think the thing that was missing was the social capital, but then also the monetary capital. Like, you know, nobody in my family is an accredited investor. So our friends and family around, I use that term loosely. It was asking old colleagues to ask a friend of a friend, people's great aunts, like anybody who would listen to the story, who was willing to put in $5,000, $10,000. Um, you know, we were always about to run out of money. We were it just like, when you would get to the end of the rope, the rope would get a little bit longer and you would get the sign that you, you should keep going. But it, it was um, hard because of, of a lack of resources and access to capital and like monetary capital and social capital. Yeah, I, I think to piggyback on what Denise was just talking about, I mean, it comes down to a little bit of the things that we are taught to apologize for, right? Like gumption, right? Um, it's also about the things that we are not taught about self-empowerment, right? There's a famous study where the difference between a, a wealthy child and a child that could seemingly be impoverished is that the impoverished child will not question the things that he's or she is taught or told to do. Whereas in a wealthy child will be told to do something and then they will question why, right? My mother famously says, well, become a why baby. Right. So it's one of those things where, you know, if we use the things that are at our disposal, we're, we're natural salespeople. We have this natural gumption. We talk about a pandemic, but we've been in my, in my neighborhood, in my community, we've been terrorized for a long time. Right. So if you take those things and you couple them all together and it gives you that, you know, the, that that heart that we all talk about and that we popularize, but then we're taught to, you know, play down a little bit. It's having the courage to be a natural salesperson, right? And I'm not saying that you have the 
you know, no pun intended, not to be blasphemous, you don't have to have the cadence of a Dr. King, but you have to have that reassurance in yourself in the faith that says, hey, I believe in my product, I believe in what I'm selling, so that when I go and I walk these trade shows, like we used to go to uh, what, you know, SEIC, right, Lanier, and we would take these meetings, and everybody would say, listen, Kyle, I'm only taking a meeting because of Corey, right? And I called Chipotle twice a year for four years in a row, right? And when I was leaving the city of North, um, Lisa Drake from, the, you know, head of real estate for East Coast Chipotle calls it, hey, we're finally going to do a deal in North, right? But it was just literally because I kept going to her and said, listen, I love your burritos. You mean I'm the only brother in the whole city that likes Chipotle burritos? No, you know what I'm saying? And they did the deal, right? So it's one of those things that we have to use what we're taught and not play down on it so much, but you also have to learn that lingo. I mean, we're taught, like Michelle Obama says, I've been at this, I've been at these tables, right? And I'm gonna let you in on a secret. They are no better or no smarter than you are. And as long as you have that faith, right? And a belief in your product, I think that we can go to these tables and start either demanding our seat or making your own table because you have to have faith that says, listen, oh, my table is not wobbly. You know, I don't have two legs. I have four legs too on my table. It's a good table and I, I can eat and it's gonna serve my, service my family well. Wow, that's, <laughs> Lanier, anything to add to that, please? No, I mean, literally this is, um, I think this is a moment, right? So we all have talked about 2020 is pandemic protest and political pandemonium. That's how I call it, PPPP, right? But again, there's this role now where there's urgency to the moment around racial justice investing, around you know these macro announcements, $100 million, $30 billion. I have a, a spreadsheet that I've been keeping where there's been over 40, I don't know, $46 billion of commitments to impact investing with, you know, with, into businesses that are led by entrepreneurs of color into you know, racial justice initiatives. Uh, and so the, my focus has been, and I think the, the call for all of us is to create you know, vehicles and vessels as I think about it, investable business strategies. You know, Denise has an investable business strategy. Kai has a very growing restaurant uh, you know, enterprise that is an investable business strategy. Right? And so uh, as we now can do deals and can communicate the value propositions of both ourselves, our communities, and our business uh, ability to be profitable, that's what the moment is calling for. And uh, all of the people who I know who've been sort of relentless, you know, and just, um, you know, passionate about trying to find ways to create enterprises and trying to find ways to get capital to expand and grow, even during 2020, you know, have been able to make progress. So. Um, Again, Stanley's film, if nothing else, it communicated the resilience of black business owners. The ability to see opportunity, to assemble resources, to communicate the strategies, to find investors. You know, I, I, I often joke that, you know, people always say you gotta do a friend and family round, friends and family round, friends and family round. And many of you know that in my twenties, I started my business and everyone said friends and family round. So I, read, I went around to my friends and family and I got a round of applause, right? It wasn't that they weren't you know, supportive, they were very much encouraging, but because of the history of systemic racism, the history of uh, you know, just not having equal opportunity, they couldn't invest 20, 50, 10,000. You know, I couldn't risk losing my $10,000 to invest in your business idea. I believe now, that moment is changing. If we can communicate the, the value proposition of our business, how it's mm -hmm. going to be profitable, mm -hmm. I think there's more opportunity now. Uh, mm -hmm. There's more friends and family there. You know, we're institutionalizing, uh, you know, the friends and family round now. Uh, and it's something I'm really excited about. Yeah, yeah. No, this is it's exciting times. And, and, and Stanley, I want to come back to you because you talked about, you know, in, in your research, realizing that you know, when we got here, the rules of the game changed, right? And we got here. So in, in terms of the future for Black creatives, right, what do you see uh, in terms of 
the rules changing in the next 10, 20 years? I think we have to be prepared for the rules not to change, you know, that, that if, if the rules stay the same, you know, we'll still do what we do and we'll still figure out a way to be successful. If the rule, if the rules change and, and, you know, things get better and get easier then then great, you know? Um, so, but I, one thing I wanted to, to, to talk about too is, is just the concept of, of excellence, you know, because we can all talk about, you know, setting up businesses, you know, I know for, for, um, you know, our film business, you know, what, what we're centered, centered on is, is, is excellence. And that, and, and, and we, we figure that with excellence research, you know, and being prepared, a lot will take care of itself. But if, if, you know, if, if you take any business, you know, partake, you know, if, if, if your food isn't good, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter what stores you're in. You know, so so we really got to make sure that 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 we, we talk about excellence. You know, if if Kai's restaurants, uh, you know, people don't go there and they don't have a great experience, then it, it, it you know it doesn't matter how many restaurants he opens. So so we really have to always think of, of, about you know excellence and then also you know doing the research to to make sure that you know. Um, w- we're spending our time doing something that, that, that people need and really want. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, do you at Firelight, do you guys have any upcoming documentaries that we need to be on the lookout for in terms of social justice, equality piece? Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we just, uh, we just uh, did our first film for Netflix uh, called Crack, uh, which- um, Also uh, excellent, very excellent. Uh, yeah, which which premiered a week ago on, on the eleventh. On it dropped on uh, on Netflix. Um, it's called Crack: Colon Cocaine Corruption and Conspiracy, uh, or some some iteration of those three words. <laughs> but you know, we, we got that, and, and then uh, on Netflix, we still have Miles Davis: Birth of the Cool, um, and you know, and, and we're doing a, a, a film on Attic of the Attic of Rebellion. Uh, for the 50th anniversary of that. Oh, we're doing a, a lot of things, you know. Um, but I, I think that that I, I'm kind of different from 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 the, the other people on the panel because I'm kind of an accidental entrepreneur, you know. I just was, was making films and uh, you know and and you know just trying to make the best films that I that I could and you know it kind of took off and and you know we're we're, we're learning how to change our business model and, and really handle. Um, uh, the kind of things that are being that are coming our way so uh, it's really exciting time exciting time for you know to make films yeah so you you, you mentioned that you you know you don't have that corporate um, background as as most of the panelists do so what as an entrepreneur of color in the creative space what what do we need to succeed what things do we have to have in us what traits what I think it's the same thing you know no matter you know if, if you're you know in the food industry, if you're real estate restaurants, you know, you have to uh, have, try to persevere. And, and you know, um, I, I, I love what, what Denise said, you know, um, you know, one of, one of the great lessons for me is, is that um, early on in my career, uh, somebody said, you know, well, a black man has to work twice as hard as a white guy. And I, I was like, well, okay, thanks for telling me. You know, that's, if that's all I got to do, I can do that, you know, that, you know, uh, and, and, you know, and, and I just work, work harder, you know, harder than anybody. I, I got a, I, I had a, had a really uh, kind of career changing job and I just made sure I was the last one to leave the office. You know, if I had to sit there and read a newspaper, <laughs> I would sit there and read the newspaper and just like everybody left and I leave, you know, and they loved me. They like Stanley works real hard. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, it, it succeed in anything, you know, it's kind of just the same thing. Just, you know, you've got to, you know, you know, put time in and, 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 and study and research uh, and know what people want, you know. But I, I also, you know, it's a kind of a crazy thought and I would love to hear what other people say. You know, but entrepreneurship is not for everybody, right? You know, I have one of my, my one of my best friends I grew up with, you know, when he was 21, he he got a job at the fire department, worked for 20 years, you know, retired, then worked another 20 years for somebody else and retired. Now he's retired and I'm sitting here still working, you know, uh, so so, you know, it, 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 
I mean, and that's perfectly honorable, you know, and, and you know, it, it, it's, it's perfectly great. It's not, it's not for everybody. So anyway, I've said my piece. Yeah, the, the other panelists, please weigh in on that too. <laughs> Entrepreneurship for being for everyone. That's true. I think um, oftentimes people have this mix, misconception that when you're an entrepreneur, you don't have a boss, but like, you know, tangentially like Target and Trader Joe's, like I have to answer to them if there's a problem, if the load didn't show up on time, if there's a quality issue, these investors who gave me this money and expect that I'm going to deliver some results, like I have to answer to them. Our employees, like I'm, you know, while I'm guiding the strategy of the business, and I, I think that's another part, important part of entrepreneurship, like being able to listen, but also being able to have conviction in your thoughts and your beliefs and stand true to that and make decisions. Because if you're waffling around, like one, nobody's going to really have faith in you and like the ship's just going to be moving all over the place. And, and so I think there are definitely some traits that are really important to, to being an entrepreneur and being a successful entrepreneur. And I think there's often a lot of misconceptions about it being glamorous, or you get to be the boss, and you get to make all the rules, and you get to like decide all these things. You also get to do a lot of the work like I remember when we started, like somebody would email marketing at Partake, accounting at Partake, orders at Partake, and it was all coming to my phone. Like there was no one else. And so I think getting comfortable with that, particularly as people of color, because I think oftentimes, you know, some of our, our counterparts are starting businesses with a lot more resources. But for, for most of the folks I know, it's, you know, you start on your own and you start small and you figure it out. And, and so I think there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about entrepreneurship that exists. Right. I, I think... I remember Chike asked me to speak to some of his students uh, a couple of years ago. And I told him, I was like, hey, listen, I'm, I may not be the best person uh, because when I come into a room, I tell people, they ask me who I am, what I'm doing. And I always answer that I am the person that everybody seemingly values the least. And what I mean by that is I'm the janitor or I, I scrub the toilets because nobody comes in to starting a business wanting to make uh, a souffle and say, well, I also want to clean my toilets. But if no one else shows up, you're responsible, right? And you have to be willing to do the thing that people value the least, the thing that you don't want to do. So if you ever want to get into whatever the field is, if you want to be a filmmaker, you should ask, you know, Stanley, hey, can I come and do research for you, right? And you should see how long it takes for somebody to do research on a clip that may even be tossed in the editing room, right? Nobody gets in and say, hey, listen, I wanna be a, I wanna, you know, they will always, everybody wants an Oscar, right? But nobody ever wants to be on the editing room floor. And I think that's what uh, we need to start te teaching people to do, um, you know, just to have a full circle. Sorry about that. Lanier? Yeah, so, you know, I'll add, um, you know, I call it, um, uh, there's entrepreneurs out of necessity, there's entrepreneurs by choice. Um, you know, I call, you know, I'm a hybrid entrepreneur, right? I, I've been a, a, an entrepreneur uh, where I was 100%, you know, in with both feet. Um, and now I have, you know, my uh, job at Rutgers and my, you know, my investment business as well. And I'm happy here, right? So it's both sides, right? Both sides of the brain. So uh, I think you have to figure out, there's an old line that says an entrepreneur is someone who works 80 hours for himself because he doesn't want to work 40 hours for somebody else, right? So it really is, I put in the time, but it becomes passion work. And so um, I think it is very, and we need people on the other side. We need people of color in banking and in finance and, you know, in corporate careers, you know, in, in Target to be able to, to hear our stories and see our opportunities. So, um, you know, again, however, I still do believe that part of our strategy has to be around owning assets, whether we're an investor in Kai's business or an owner of real estate on the block, or, you know, um, you know, we started something called the Black and Latino Angel Investment Fund of New Jersey. And it's really exciting. It just uh, started out with a dozen, you know, local people, a local real estate agent, one of the Rutgers professor, Queen Latifah's accountant, you know, um, you know, uh, the head of Planned Parenthood office, right? Just local people who said, yeah, you know, I'll invest $50,000 of my own money uh, to identify people of color who have growth businesses that we believe we could, 
you know, our capital, you know, could help grow. So, you know, there's opportunities there for people who are in corporate to support entrepreneurship and to be investors and, you know, to participate in economic growth, even if you're not, you know, Ty Campbell or, or Denise taking the full risk, uh, you know, and having the, you know, both the highs and lows of entrepreneurship. And they are many. Again, I've, you know, been on the cover of Cranes and I've been at the, um, you know, at the door of the bankruptcy court and you people, you know, they don't tell you, uh, you know, I've been, I failed when it wasn't cool to fail. Right now it's like, oh, you fail, you learn. And that maybe afterwards it feels good to fail, right? But to fall, to fall, to get back up, to rebuild the business, to keep your reputation, to, you know, raise capital again. Uh, all of those things are, you know, the resiliency of entrepreneurs. And again, I keep going back. If you haven't see, seen it, see it before 12, all of that is communicated in a much so thorough way in Stanley documentary. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm not his hype man. I'm just a fan. And it was a, you know, phenomenal, phenomenal film. So we all need a hype man, right? We all need one. So in that in that regard, for each of you, can you talk about the team you built around you and why and how that's vital to your success, the team that you've built around you? For me, I think there's the the personal board of advisors and then there's the the team that partakes. So kind of personally, I didn't tell a lot of people initially about the idea. Um, I told my parents and they were like, why would you ever leave a secure corporate job? And after seeing their reaction, I was like, I don't need to talk to anyone else about this because I'm, I'm going to do this regardless and I don't need any negative energy in my head. Um, and so I, I just kind of kept it to myself outside of a couple of, of girlfriends and, and my husband and, and my daughter. And, you know, I think the thing that's been interesting is how many people want to cheer for you when it's cool to cheer for you. But like the people who were there, like sharing my Kickstarter campaign is real different than the people who are like, oh, sharing the Rihanna article. And so remembering who those people are. And then when I think about our team at Partake, also remembering those people who are like, you know, when I was like, can you put this on your personal credit card and I'll get you next time because like we don't have money to go to the trade show. And instead of bringing in people who are so pedigreed and have this experience, remembering who was there for the business when we needed it, developing their talents, investing in those people to make sure that they can grow with the business because you know that they're there for the right reasons and the, they believe in the mission. Mm, yeah, so, um, and so I wanna go to Kai next because correct me if I'm wrong, you only hire Newark residents? Well, I mean, we, Is that... we try to hire everybody okay. in the community, um, for sure. I mean, the overwhelming majority of our staff uh, at any of the restaurants, I mean, you know, 90 to 95% of everybody we hire are Newark residents. Again, it's about that philosophy that says that I don't have to go to surrounding communities. Not that, not that there's anything wrong with that. Like, like what Lanier was saying, you know, before it was cool to be from Newark, we were excluded from certain neighborhoods and parties and stuff like that. And, you know, I know more people that have gone to Harvard from Newark than I know from Morristown, you know? So um, it's, there's excellence here to talk about what Stanley was saying. And as long as we're willing to do that work, I mean, somebody asked a question earlier and, you know, what do you do in a pre, in a, in a COVID environment, in the economy, Right now, for me, I'm like stepping back. You know, I made a bunch of decisions earlier this year that were very, very, or last year, you know, that I thought were prudent, but they were swift. And now I'm taking a step back and saying, well, hey, let me reorganize my thoughts. Um, and, you know, for us, again, it's shifting or sifting through and building out a team and waiting for that team, right? Um, I have no problem because I'm small. I can afford to do that when I'm small, you know, and say, hey, listen, this is the type of person I want on my team. Whom do I want to work with on a daily basis for 12 hours, right? That's very important to me. Who sees a value in the business? And it could be, you know, Amani managing a store. It could be Corey and Lee creating uh, social media content. It could be Lou and Ari managing, you know, a store or something like that. But all of those people, we all know that we're just one cog on that wheel, right? And I tell people all the time, you know, I don't expect people to outwork me or something like that. What I do is 
it, what I expect them to do is to hold me accountable because I'm going to hold them accountable on what we say we're going to do, right? Um, it's about an honesty in, in the work. And, and honesty is also about, you know, our commitment to the excellence. So you can't say that you're excellent and then allow yourself to take a down off and not communicate that properly to your team members and letting them down and letting them fail. Um, but it's also, that's, that's to me, that's very, it's again, it's about this black community, right? The black and brown communities, urban communities, disadvantaged communities um, that are a lot more close knit than we like to talk about. Like we like to say that North is a very big city, but we're really a small town, you know what I mean? And if we treated ourselves like the small town and groups of families that we are, I think we would uh, be able to excel a lot better. Agreed, agreed, yeah. Uh, we just had a comment. Every time I go into Burger Wild, the staff is so warm and welcoming. <laughs> it's true. That's true. That might be somebody I gave free fries for that comment. Uh, <laughs> either way, I appreciate it. <laughs> so Stanley, um, Firelight has a few different, um, I don't know if you want to call them divisions or, I don't know, departments, right? So in, in, your, in your company, how, how have you picked the team and how how vital is the team to what you do? Uh, you know, the, the, the team is, is everything. And um, I've just been really lucky. I, I, uh, you know, I, don't, I don't think you should try this at home. I, I work with my wife, uh, Marsha Smith. And, you know, um, it's, it's just, it, we kind of really complement each other because, you know, I think we're really good at, at, at different things. And so, um, you know, that, that, that it really works. Um, uh, and and uh, another a woman, Aloyda Limbal, who runs the documentary lab that we, we've been running for 10 years, um, where we mentor uh, uh, filmmakers of color all over the country. We've had over 100 graduates of, of the doc lab. We've you know, had the opening night film at Sundance, and we've won Emmys and, and Peabody's and DuPont's and, and everything um, with, with them. And, and, you know, I just, you know, in, in some ways, you know, I've been really lucky and, um, you know, but but it, it's hard. I mean, you know, you know, hiring people and expanding, you know, because we're expanding now, you know, you have to make really good choices. Um, and, and, and you have to make really good choices in so many ways. I mean, in personality, you know, in work ethic, in, in just so many different ways that, that to, to find, you know, the people that, that really fit uh, with with what, whatever you're trying to do and, and you know that agree with um, how you're progressing but you know we also try to try to uh, uh, have a, a really a wonderful work environment and I, I found that that you know for for people mostly African Americans that, that we're hiring you know um, you, you know they, they, they can work with a lot of joy you know and, and a lot of motivation you know, we're, 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 we're a black company making films about black folks, you know, um, and, and we really respect and, 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 and love the people that, that we work with and love the work that we do. We try to uh, uh, convey that to everybody and work with people who, who are of like minds because we work hard. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. I love it. Uh, Lanier. This is... Unmute, 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 Lanier. I missed the T up, uh, GK. One more. Um, I'm sorry. So, yep. so we talked about the team, right, and and building the team around you. So, in your um, entrepreneurial journey, how have you built the team, and how vital is that team to the success? No, I mean every entrepreneur, you know, the team, you know, either co-founders more and more, but spending time saying, you know. Uh, this research now is sort of pointing to the fact that uh, companies that are, you know, sort of co-founded have a higher probability of attracting capital, higher probability of success. Um, you know, again, building a team that has capacity and, you know, whether typically, you know, the entrepreneur has the ability to sort of tell the story, you know, about the mission, you know, to be the salesman or, you know, to, um, or, you know, sort of the technical expertise. It's very rare that you can find somebody who can make it and manage it and finance it, you know, and market it, you know. And so, you know, to the extent that, uh, you know, you can build a team, I've always had um, really, you know, very great sort of detailed um, 
accounting staff around me. I found that was my way to grow, that I could go out and brain make and sort of build relationships, but I needed someone to say, man, that's not profitable. Or, you know, uh, right now, my, you know, in my firm right now, someone sends me a report every Monday. Here's where our cash is, right? Here's what we have coming up. And so, you know, that level of just being able to, you know, rely on different expertise that will allow your business to grow, you know, it's essential. Yeah, no, that's that's true. I, I appreciate that. Um, and I still laugh when we were talking the other day and you said you invest in small strip malls. That was that was <laughs> I'm still laughing at that. Yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> but um no, I just wanna I just wanna thank all of our panelists to, uh tonight because all the insight you shared about um your journey, I'm sure is extremely helpful to everybody that was on here listening today. Um, and so I want to wrap up with some closing remarks, um, but more specifically, uh, not but, and more specifically, some action steps that you can give the people that are watching us this evening. So um, I'll start with Denise and then we'll go around. Um, in terms of action steps, somebody, um, when I worked at Coke, Seth Goldman, who started Honest Tea, gave me this advice and it was to just get started. I remember I would call him and I would say, well, I don't know about this distributor. And do you think the polka dots are big enough on the packaging and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, go out and talk to the customers and see what's working and see what's not working. And don't be so worried about everything being perfect from day one. Understand the business, understand why you're doing it. And because as we talked about earlier, like the why is going to have to sustain you on the really low lows. And there's going to be no matter what your journey is there, there's going there, those are going to exist. And so understanding your why and understanding your business. But if it's something you're moving forward with, rather than kind of getting just caught up in a bunch of decision making to, to just get going and, and to get started and that it's OK to start small. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lanier. Close remarks, action steps. Close remarks on my end. Again, I think there's there's opportunity, right? Um, you know, again, we formed the Black and Latino Angel Investment Fund. Become an investor. Let's invest. You know, you can use your capital to invest in other uh, growth companies that are led by people of color, right? Uh, I have a crowdfunding campaign going on right now to help people of color own shopping centers, right? So whether you're an entrepreneur out there doing it, trying to start a new venture, uh, there are programs that we run at Rutgers that give people capacity to create a business plan or strategic plan or you know, the pitch deck to raise capital. There's a fund and we all, if you're not seeking money, look for an opportunity to invest in projects, the Black and Latino um, uh, Angel Investment Fund in New Jersey. Um, or you know, come on with us, right? Uh, there's a guy that I really respect in Newark, a guy named Jeff Billingsley, and he taught me a hashtag. It said hashtag Let's Own, right? Hashtag yeah. Let's Own, Let's Own together, right? Uh, well, let's do something. Shouts to Jeff Billingsley. If you know Newark, you definitely know him. Yeah. Um, so Kai, you want to give us uh, your closing remarks and some action steps? Yeah. Um, so my mother was. Uh, actually more of an entrepreneur you know than my father but my father would tell me all the time you know what's your one week plan what's your one month plan what's your one year plan what's your three year plan what's your five year plan and in those different plans there are a million different things that can go right and a million things that can go wrong we always plan for the million things that can go right but sometimes you have to know the devil and you have to listen to them as an advocate to say, all right, let me know what I should not do, right? And if you create plan, I have a notebook, I'm always writing down stuff, a to-do list or something like that. And it is literally focused on the minutia of the day and how I can delegate, hopefully. Then the, also the big picture, like Lanier said, if I can go and envision things that can help steer us and control which wins we're gonna, we're gonna take, um, but you have to have a plan. And a lot of people that I've tried to um, in my previous life, tried to assist or something like that. You know, it's not just a business plan, right? There's almost a plan for a business plan and not to, you know, be bureaucratic or something like that, but you have to write things down. You have to formulate plans. You have to bounce ideas off of people that you, you trust. 
and people that you value and you have to do the research like in Stanley's films, right? He didn't, he doesn't just start with the end credits. There's a whole lot of stuff in between that opening scene and the end credits that has days, sometimes years worth of research. And in our community, we have to love the toiling of the soil, you know what I'm saying? And so many times we're taught that instant gratification is, is this thing, right? But no, we, I mean, we come from a different background to me and I, I think that we have to get back to that. You know what I mean? And, and getting back to the loving of getting our hands dirty, you know what I'm saying? Not around somebody's neck, but you know, we have to get dirty, you know what I mean? And um, yeah. you know, and there's a lot of people out here that want to get dirty. Don't tell, don't, don't adhere to the false narrative that we don't want to do the work anymore. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, got to till the land. We got to till the land. Um, Stanley, we'll end with your uh, closing. We have Q&A after this, but closing remarks and your, uh, um, you know, action steps. Sure. You know, I think that one of the things that, that was important to me uh, and one of the things that we tell all the filmmakers that, that are in the documentary lab is pay yourself something. Pay yourself. You know, and that that's really important. And and you know, I I would take ten percent out of out of any grant that I got, and I would pay myself by putting it in the bank. Now that ninety percent of the time, I put it back into the film. <laughs> but, you know, at the end, I okay, I got to put it back. But just taking it, you know, meant something that that I was. I'm not volunteering. You know, I'm not playing around. I am trying to run a business. And so I think, you know, that, that um, you know, we, and we constantly have to tell people that, that we work within the documentary lab, filmmakers, you know, you know they'll, they'll write out a whole budget and a whole pay schedule. And I'm like, well, where, where's the money that you're making? You know, you have to try to, you know, pay yourself something. Um, and even if you end up throwing it back into business that, and you may well end up throwing it back. But, you know, just the act of, of kind of taking it out meant a whole, a whole lot to me. And so, you know, just, just, you know, think about paying yourself if you can. Yeah, yeah, no, nah, that's, that's great advice from all of you. Uh, so I want to move on to the Q&A. We do have some questions. Uh, so one of the questions here, uh, of course, you know, day of service, right? So do any of you find that your entrepreneurial projects feed into any activism that you're a part of? So it goes, I'll, I'll, I'll take that in. Again, in the film, it was very clear that, you know, um, social impact, social activism is almost core to, uh, you know, the Black businessman's ethos, right? So if you you know, from supporting civil rights, that's been, you know, you know, to investing in schools, to giving back to, you know, younger entrepreneurs and scholarships, all that stuff is, you know, it's just sort of, it seems like it's almost baked into the DNA of the Black entrepreneur uh, specifically. You know, in, in my work, it, it is being a champion uh, uh, for people who, you know, people quickly will dismiss it. As, as Kai said, oh, they, you can't do that. It won't work over there, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, a lot of my work is sort of rolling up my sleeves, sort of working shoulder to shoulder to figure out how to help get something that other people say can't get done, done, right? Again, to mm -hmm. getting resources to people in places that other people just overlook or they undervalue. Like, you can't, nobody's going to do that over there. They, they, they can't figure that out. Right. And so yeah, yeah. I don't think of that as necessarily activism. Mm. It's, it's, it's just what's fun for me. Right. People tell me all the time, you do these one, two, three million dollar deals. Why don't you do a 50 million dollar deal? Honey, it's the same work. It's the same document. And maybe that's right. But some part of, of again, my, I think, gift um, or of service is trying to work to get opportunity with entrepreneurs in neighborhoods um, that other people just you know, either summarily dismiss or say it's too hard to do. Uh, that's the puzzle that I like to solve. In, in your, in the retail, in the strip malls you're buying, are you putting black owned businesses in there? Right, so we, we own two uh, small shopping centers, you know, 20,000 square feet, 10,000. And our goal is to own 10 or maybe a hundred of them, right? 
but um, we own them typically in partnership with um, some other intentionally structured black ownership. Uh, and, and, you know, we hire, hire black professionals when we have an opportunity. And to the extent that they're uh, African-American tenants, um, and, and it's really like we don't hang a, a sign on the door and say, you know, looking for, you know, you know, black restaurants are looking for black leasing agencies, not, you know, but it's who we know. We know there's excellence. We know people haven't had opportunity. We know that we can use our capital as owners to take different risk, right? Um, and to support people in a different way. And, and when you have a long-term perspective, it's not about a flip, right? It's not, you know, I was, when I was an entrepreneur, I developed, built, and sold, you know, 300 single family homes, right? It was, but I was selling. When I, it wasn't until I met Jerry Gottesman in Newark, he says, I never sell, right? I, you know, I, I create new opportunities over time. And so, you know, a long-term perspective, a view uh, to see people that other people, as I said, see, they don't have enough capital. Can I figure out how to get capital? Can I use the economic development experience to get the municipality or some other government resource to, to, to make a project viable? Okay, mm -hmm. that's passion work. Yeah, yeah, and and so so for you, Denise. Um, same question, you know. Does do you find that the entrepreneurial projects feed into activism? But then I have I have a separate another question on top of that. Is would you consider Partake Foods a social venture, or like a B Corp, as some people would we say? We are actually in the process of going through our, our B Corp certification, so hopefully we'll be a B Corp. Um, I think that's been my favorite part of the business. You know, if somebody would have asked me years ago, like, what's your goal with Partake? I would have said, you know, coming from big CPG, I see that big CPG innovates through acquisition. I want to sell this business. But as I see the social change that we can affect with our business while still having fun and making money and making a product we're proud of, that's the thing that gets me most excited. And so the ways that we do that are, are by giving back to or working with underserved and um, underrepresented folks. So like the places where I felt like I had trouble were access to social capital, access to monetary capital. And then I see in the community that there's an access, a lack of access to healthy foods. And so the way that we address those things, um, kind of starting from the end, the lack of access to healthy foods, we work with a group called the Food Equality Initiative. Uh, Emily Brown, a black woman in Kansas City, Missouri, whose family was experiencing food insecurity, started it. Her children also have food allergies. So it's a double whammy. People would like usually gluten-free, vegan, all this stuff costs more. Um, our products included because it's premium. It costs me more to make it. We haven't scaled to the point where our price point is totally accessible. So what can we do about that to get the products into the people's hands, into the mouths of kids who deserve them? And so we do um, parts of the year, we're giving back a portion of our sales to her organization. We're able to feed nearly 5,000 families in 2020. Today, we're giving away, not giving away, giving back 10% of our profit to um, Dr. King, the Dr. King Center in, in Georgia. And so how can we still make money, still run a business that investors are excited about, but also use the good that's coming our way, the support that's coming our way to invest in the communities that are supporting us um, through mentorship, through the HBCU fellowship program that we have to hopefully give these students access to capital, to, to social capital that I, I just didn't have, to access to jobs, to access to internships. And so what can we do while still running a profitable business to give back? And, and so that's something we weave into every decision that we're making. Yes, that's awesome. We love it. We love it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I'm going to jump over to Stanley and Stanley um, there's two questions. So one, the first question was, um, do your does your entrepreneurial projects feed any activism? Uh, and then the second question is, you mentioned that in the last, I guess, year or so, you've had to kind of pivot and change business strategies. So can you speak to both of those? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that, uh, you know, my activism is many times through the films, you know, um, you know, the, the films are, are about kind of social action and, uh, um, but, you know, I, I always have to say that, that I, I first think of myself as a filmmaker, you know, um, it doesn't matter, you know, what, what you make a film about. If, if, if Boss had been a crappy film, you know, we, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it, you know, so we have to make, we have to try to make, you know, really excellent films, and and then, um, you know, uh, well, the films go go where they are, um, 
And I, I just, I think that, um, you know, the business model for documentary films um, it has just changed, you know, in, in the last few years, you know, with, with kind of Netflix and Hulu and Amazon and, you know, ESPN and HBO and, and, and all the, you know, it's just, the world has just changed. Um, you know, for the first time, maybe, uh, you know, this summer after the murder of George Floyd, we had people calling, calling us up you know, and, and wanting to, you know, you know, give us money to produce films or wanting to, to give us money, you know, to support the documentary lab. And, and that was, that was, you know, something new, you know, before we were, we would have to really beat the bushes, you know, to, to raise money. And, and so, so, so there's that change, but, you know, probably the change won't last, you know, uh, you know, well, the white guilt won't last, but we'll, we'll try to take advantage of it as much as we can, um, because, you know, uh, you know, but but I have to also say, you know, the the, the money uh, that was offered to us, you know, was not money that that uh, we we had to feel bad about taking. You know, we could feel really good about taking the money because mm -hmm. you know, the, you know the, it wasn't coming from, you know, um, I don't want to say anything. It wasn't it wasn't coming from 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 people that that, that we wouldn't want to 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 kind of get in bed with. So so we we're, we're happy to to do that um but it, it's changed you know and also because you know we've been we've had you know a fair amount of success over the years so you know over over the last year calendar year you know miles davis uh, premiered and and uh we, we did a four-hour film for espn on michael vick called vick uh and then the other film uh just you know crack just premiered and we've got like five or six projects in, in the pipeline so uh, you know, we're trying to take advantage of, we're trying to put more people to work. We're trying to put more people of color to work um, mm -hmm. and just expand what we do. Absolutely. We're, we're looking forward to those. I'm actually looking forward to the crack one because Lanier keeps talking about that one. So I'm definitely going to watch that one. And then the one you mentioned about Wounded Knee, going to check that one out as well. Um, so I guess this is this is going to be one of our last questions. So to, to all the panelists, um, where do you recommend younger entrepreneurs go uh, when looking for like-minded mentors or like-minded or to go network with like-minded individuals? Um, Pre-COVID, post-COVID. <laughs> Are there any specific support networks or groups that you can actually give us so that people can actually go and, and get some? Well, my sense is in and around Newark. I mean, they're you know, uh, Karen leads for whatever Sustainable Business Alliance and just announced, um, you know, the Impact Hub. Um, you know, Rutgers, we have our, you know, sort of outreach uh, programs, uh, Entrepreneurship Pioneers Initiative, our Newark Business Hub, um, you know, NJ Pack has from Rising Tide Capital, uh, the SBDC, uh, you know, Lincoln Park, uh, you know, has entrepreneurship initiatives, uh, you know, the work uh, at Avi with neighborhoods. And I'm sure I'm missing somebody that 10 minutes from now, I'm a, you know, Jill Johnson has great, Greater Newark Enterprises Corporation, right? I'm, I'm, you know, Invest Newark, right? So just, you know, it's hard when you start naming, but there's, there's a host of people wanting to support entrepreneurs. And in there, um, you know, you I think, think not either or every place has, you know, some people like informality of certain programs. Some people love Jill Johnson because she went to Harvard and they respect that and she's got a, a, a way of, of operating. Some people, you know, want to check into the SBDC and then you know do some work and come back out. Some people have a political connection and and believe you know the city uh, programs might be helpful. So all, all I'm saying is it's like all these programs you get out of it what you put in. Um, and I think a young entrepreneur will find people that they identify with, right? That you know Kai's approach of may you know Kai may be a great mentor for someone, and they you know they may and other people may not like Kai. Some people will say, well, he has a great mentor. And I mean, not then people say, I don't like that guy, right? So I think over time, you figure out who thinks like you, who challenges you to grow, and whether it's an informal 
you know, you walk into Burger Walla or any of Kai's restaurants, I'm sure that you'll have some opportunity to see other business owners to get his perspective uh, or walk into some of the formal programs that are organized and funded specifically, you know, to help catalyze and, you know, encourage other entrepreneurship. I, I think that uh, if I can piggyback on that, it's, again, it goes back to just being bold. Um, before we got on, I, I, I talked, I mentioned to Stanley, he would not remember this and he should not remember this, but 20 years ago, I was working for the city of Newark and I was very, I wanted to be a filmmaker, right? And I knew about him and I knew about, and I, so I figured out somebody that was close to him um, and I figured, how could I go and just do anything in that office, right? And I started doing research for somebody who was doing research for him. But if, and it goes back to how I started a restaurant. Like I always knew in high school and then helping my, pay my way through college, if I knew how to use a knife, somebody's gonna give me a job. So I could walk in. So I tell people, walk in with your knife, right? Walk into any office in America. I, with social media, and how people do, you know, geotags and you can find somebody, you know, if you wanted to run into Richard Branson, I'm pretty sure if you were, you know, thoughtful enough and you were, had enough gumption, you could find him and you're going to find his driver. You're going to find somebody that buys his water and say, Hey, listen, how can I get to this brother? And I'm willing to do whatever I have to, you know what I'm saying? You want to go and meet Bob Johnson somehow, some way you're going to go and meet that brother. You know what I'm saying? You want to go and meet anybody. You want to go and meet Denise. I'm pretty sure that I'm not. Don't please don't go and stalk this this sister, please. But there's somehow that you can go and and intern and partake. You want to come and look, I tell people all the time. Oh, you're in culinary school. All right, bring your knives. I'll, I'll let's start cutting onions. You know what I'm saying? You know, let's do something. And I think that we just have to, you know, have to be bold. We're not taught that. You know what I'm saying? But it's something that we have to do. And it's, it's, you know, it's a bit of that sacrifice because somebody, if you show enough effort and you learn to speak the language, it's not also, I just come in however I want. You have to learn, okay, what language does this sister or brother speak? You know what I'm saying? I'm going to train myself to do that. And I'm going to show them that I can be an asset to them so that I can learn and I can be, you know, a young Padawan or something like that and, and learn, you know what I mean? And I think that's what we need to do. But first, you got to humble yourself and say, hey, I'm willing to go at this level so I can build up, you know? Yeah. Denise, last, last, last words from you, Denise. You know, I wish I really just want to echo what Kai said, because I think the same thing, like the world is too small now between social media and, and kind of the way the world operates, like you can touch anyone you want to touch. So figure out the language that they speak. I'm not saying just run up on people, but like you can find most people, you can contact them, understand what type of, what value you're bringing to them. And sometimes it's like somebody who's uber successful just wants to mentor people. And maybe you're from the same community that they are, or maybe you're from the same town that their grandmother grew up in and had a restaurant and you just never know. So like do the research, speak the language and go after what you want. Sometimes you just gotta snap. I'm, I'm, I like jazz, so you just, you know. Um, all right, so um, I wanna, um, I wanna thank you, thank you, thank you on behalf of everybody that has listened. I've been taking notes. I know Kai's been take. I don't know the uh, the attendees have been taking notes. This was really amazing. Um, I'm just, I'm honored to be even a part of this, um, and I want to pass this back to Donna. Uh, at NJPAC for, um, you know, her final uh, remarks and whatnot. Thank you. Thank you, Chike. And panel, my goodness, you took us to class tonight. Thank you so much. We needed that. We are in a new era where it's opportunities, I think, for everyone to try to live their dream. So we appreciate you uh, sharing such an inspiring discussion and your experiences and your honesty. Um, that's exactly what we needed. So thank you again. Uh, I'd like to invite um, everyone to attend our next social justice panel, which will be held on February 15th, 7 p.m., same time. And this one will be on the topic of educational justice, American promise. So that's also based on a documentary. 
And in this panel, we're going to look at the role that educational system plays in advancing and denying justice to children of color and the impact that systemic racism has on the experience in the classroom and beyond. Uh, so we hope you'll tune in for that one. But of course, we want to thank PSE and G for your continued support. We hope everyone has a wonderful evening, another great week, and thank you again. Good night. Good night. Good night.